Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed with our first monitor review of 2020, the frequently requested ViewSonic VX2758 2KP MHD. This is one of the worst named monitors I have ever come across. The Alphabet Soup here has reached a truly crazy level with this one. It's a very confusing product name given ViewSonic has several other monitors with similar names but different specs. Don't really know why they've chosen such confusing names for some of their monitors, but here we are. The VX27582 KP MHD is a very attractive monitor for a couple of reasons. It's a 27 inch 1440p 144Hz IPS gaming monitor so it's hitting all those key specifications that gamers love to see really nailing that sweet spot but it offers this at a budget oriented price tag of around 320 US dollars or about 450 Aussie going on pricing in the last few months this makes it the cheapest high refresh 1440p IPS monitor on the market undercutting other popular options like the Pixio PX7 Prime and offering a more value oriented alternative to the flagship LG 27 GL850. It's not as cheap as some VA options like the AOC CQ27 G2 we covered a few weeks back, with that option selling for about 250 US dollars. But for many people, the upgrade from a curved VA to a faster and flat IPS is going to be worth that price premium. And it's really hard to understate how popular this ViewSonic monitor has been. After ViewSonic said that they weren't going to send out a review unit, we had to wait several weeks for stock to arrive in Australia with the guys at PC case gear helping us get one just before Christmas. And it's not just Australia where these monitors are frequently unavailable. At the time of filming this video, it's also out of stock on Amazon with no return date in sight. So if you are interested in this monitor, be sure you carefully check the product name and include the 2KP MHD part in your search. If you accidentally end up with the PMHD version instead, that's just a 1080p monitor, not 1440p. And this is kind of why I hate the name ViewSonic is used here, but whatever. It is what it is. The VX27582 KP MHD has a lot of other features you'll be after for gaming like adaptive sync support with low frame rate compensation and a backlight strobing mode for blur reduction. It is a wide gamut panel with a rated 96% DCI-P3 coverage but there's no HDR functionality as you'd probably expect from a mid-range monitor. What the VX2758 doesn't have is a particularly ergonomic stand. There is no height adjustment here, just tilt support. So if you want to raise the screen up from its fairly low sitting position, you'll need to make use of the VESA mount. Depending on whether you have a VESA arm or not, this can add a bit of cost to the overall unit price if you do need height adjustability. And it's a feature many of its competitors, including the cheaper CQ27 G2, to provide. The rest of the design is very basic using standard black plastic with a few silver highlights. It's not particularly thin, it doesn't use any fancy materials, but at the same time it doesn't look bad. It's a fine mid-range design that seems reasonably well put together. I'd have liked to see a nicer stand here in particular, both from a materials and ergonomic standpoint, but I can understand why they went down the cheap route to ensure that there's an overall low price point. There's three main ports here with DisplayPort, HDMI 1.4 and HDMI 2.0. There's also two built-in speakers which are terrible quality, worse than laptop quality, so removing them was probably another area ViewSonic could have cut costs. On the other hand, I'd have liked to see ViewSonic add a directional toggle for controlling the on-screen display, rather than leaving it up to the face buttons on the side, which make navigation a bit difficult. At first, it looks like there's a lot of features packed into ViewSonic's dense OSD, but many of the various panels and options are pretty standard, like controlling colors, contrast, black levels, and so on. There's a blue light filter and dynamic contrast as well, but no cheat crosshairs or other gamer-specific features. The only major inclusion in here is a fairly average backlight strobing mode, which of course can't be enabled while using Adaptive Sync. With that said, it's not unusual to see a limited feature set in budget displays. It's really only in high-end products from companies like ASUS, Acer and Gigabyte do you see all sorts of stuff, most of which you'll probably never use. The big question mark here is naturally performance. The VX2758 sits between budget VAs and premium IPS models in the market, so how it compares to those options is really going to set the tone as to whether this monitor is worth buying or not. After all, we want to see better performance than a VA to justify spending about $70 more, and getting as close as possible to those $500 IPS variants would be nice but definitely unexpected. So let's start with the three overdrive modes which are standard, 
advanced and ultra fast. Standard is quite slow as is usually the case with the baseline overdrive mode. I can't imagine anyone will use this mode for gaming. Advanced does quicken things up a bit, but again, it's nothing spectacular with a 7.73 millisecond grade to grade average and not much overshoot to speak of. This isn't a great mode for 144 Hz gaming given just 57% of transitions fall within a reasonable tolerance of the 6.94 millisecond refresh rate window, so we will get a bit of smearing here. What about ultra fast? Well, here's where things are quite interesting. This mode is right on the limit of what this panel can do. The greater grade average is very impressive at just 4.36 milliseconds, and most of the slight dark level smearing you get from the advanced mode is completely eliminated here. This leads to 100% of transitions falling within the refresh window, so smearing overall is very well managed and you're getting a true 144 hertz experience. On the other hand, overshoot has crept up a bit, and there are some transitions where inverse ghosting trails are visible, which you can see from the red areas in the chart. 15% of transitions have what I'd class as noticeable inverse ghosting, which is right on our usual tolerance, but of course that does mean that 85% of the time you likely won't notice the problem. So it's a balancing act here, and I think at least at 144Hz it makes more sense to use ultra fast than advanced given the much faster response times. However, using the ultra fast mode isn't always the best course of action. Even moving the refresh rate down slightly to just 120Hz does result in a big increase to overshoot, which causes unsightly inverse ghosting. Yeah, the response time average around 4.3 milliseconds is maintained, but ultra fast isn't a great experience here due to those inverse ghost trails you'll see behind fast moving objects. It gets even worse at 60 hertz, now with 60% of transitions and nearly every rising response overshooting massively, which looks quite bad. On the other hand, the advanced mode at both these refresh rates is pretty good. At 120Hz we're looking at a 6.83 millisecond grade grade average with no ghosting, and at 60Hz this improves marginally to a 6.51 millisecond average with a bit of overshoot but nothing overly bad. This does leave you in a bit of a dilemma as to what overdrive mode to choose because there are two optimal options here. At 144Hz, ultra fast makes the most sense, but at anything below 144Hz, advanced is better. This throws a bit of a spanner into the works for adaptive sync gamers in particular who might not always be gaming right up at 144Hz. If the refresh rate is bouncing around 100 to 120Hz, for example, using the advanced mode will deliver a better experience. Yes, slower response times, but fewer fewer artifacts from much better overshoot handling. So how does this stack up to other monitors? Well, at first glance, the VX27582 KP MHD is quite competitive up against the LG 27 GL850, coming in just a bit slower with a response time in the 4 millisecond range. It also easily outperforms monitors like the Pixio PX7 Prime and AOC CQ27 G2, at least at the maximum refresh rate with the optimal overdrive mode for that refresh rate. It also has no no issues with dark level smearing, pretty standard for an IPS monitor, as well as perfect response time compliance. So far so good. The error rate though is really where this display falls behind the rest of the pack. The VX2758 with its borderline usable ultra fast mode sits right at the bottom of these charts, below the PX7 Prime, the CQ27G2 and most notably the LG27 GL850. Where previously the ViewSonic and LG options were neck and neck for response time averages, the LG does so with significantly lower error rates. This is further shown in the inverse ghosting chart where the 27 GL850 is again much better and even the PX7 Prime is a fair bit better in this area. And this continues with the 60Hz comparison where now the VX2758 is more a mid-tier performer with the LG27 GL850 pulling ahead by several milliseconds. The AOC CQ27G2 is slightly faster here while the PX7 Prime is slightly slower. But given the complicated nature of how the VX2758 performs, I think the best comparison is to simply look at the actual response time charts for the four monitors we've been talking about and dive in a little bit further. I'm going to do a picture in picture here with four charts which will make the numbers hard to read, but what's most important to look at is simply the colours and the amount of red in each chart. When the ViewSonic VX27582 KP MHD is set to its ultra fast mode at 144Hz, you can see the response time performance is similar to the 27GL850, but clearly the 27GL850 has better error handling 
with its optimal overdrive mode. Meanwhile, the PX7 is slower and the CQ27 G2 slower again, with the AOC model's use of a VA panel delivering dark level smearing, which you can see in the top left corner of its response chart. However, the VX2758's ultra-fast mode only makes sense for fixed use at 144Hz. Now let's assume we're using these monitors with adaptive sync enabled, in which case using the advanced mode on the ViewSonic is the mode to use. The other monitors don't need settings tweaks, so now we see the VX2758 pull back to more like PX7 Prime level performance, with the 27G850 staying well ahead. The CQ27G2 is similar in its average, but the spread of response times is different, the ViewSonic giving a more consistent response compared to the dark level smearing of the AOC VA model. What does all of this mean? Well, if you were going to generalize these results, I'd say for most gamers wanting to make use of adaptive sync, the VX2758 performs similarly to the Pixio PX7 Prime, so a noticeable step below the LG27 GL850. If you wanted to max out what the VX2758 can do and lock it to 144Hz, it does get much closer to LG's super fast IPS option but the 27G850 has the advantage of much faster response performance across the entire refresh rate range, so it's a better all-rounder for adaptive sync gaming, which is why I guess it costs more. Then up against a cheap VA option like the AOC CQ27G2, I wouldn't say the VX2758 is much faster, on average it's similar at 144Hz and a bit slower in fact at 60Hz, but you do get standard IPS advantages like much better dark level performance and other stuff like a flat panel instead of curved, better viewing angles and all that sort of stuff. What about input lag? No issues here. Sub 1.0 millisecond response times at 144Hz and a decently high refresh rate leads to a responsive experience. It's rare to see super slow monitors these days, but this isn't one of them. Let's take a look at color performance now, firstly exploring sRGB performance. Out of the box, the VX2758 2KP MHD delivers excellent results, much better than expected from a value-oriented display. A lot of this is down to great grayscale performance. There's neat adherence to the sRGB gamma curve here, a flat CCT curve that's basically accurate, and a low delta E average of just 1.25. So this is outstanding factory calibration. Where sRGB performance falls away a bit is due to the standard problem with these monitors in an unclamped gamut. We're looking at about 95% DCI-P3 coverage, so about 30% larger than sRGB. When left unclamped, sRGB content gets expanded up to P3, and we get oversaturation, which is what you can see in this chart. This leads to a delta E average of 2.65, which isn't awful, but sRGB images by default will look more vibrant than they should. Same stuff with color checker, an overall delta E average of 2.85, which isn't awful, but the same oversaturation issue is still here. As far as I can tell, there's no sRGB clamp in the monitor settings, and because it comes with excellent grayscale performance from the factory, there aren't any settings that can improve performance in the OSD. The only way to improve accuracy further is through a manual calibration, so let's check the results. Grayscale performance improved slightly to a sub 1.0 delta E average, but it was never bad to begin with, so this is only a minor upgrade. Where the big change from calibration occurs is in how it handles sRGB colors. Everything is getting properly mapped here, and when the monitor can easily produce 100% of the sRGB gamut, we get excellent calibrated delta E performance. No issues here at all. How does it handle DCI-P3? Well, pretty well, consistent with most wide gamut IPS gaming monitors that can do around that 95% coverage mark. We get excellent blue performance, while greens and reds are clipped slightly at the top as we aren't hitting full 100% coverage. This doesn't impact average delta E's too much, but it is something to be aware of in worst case situations. That said, this is better than most wide gamut VAs, which are more in the 90% P3 range. Brightness is decent at around 330 nits when calibrated, so that's a mid-table result, but one that should be sufficient for most gamers, especially as there's no HDR support here. Viewing angles are excellent. We get the benefit of IPS technology plus a flat panel, so there's little hue shift or brightness fall off if you're viewing the monitor at an off-normal angle. It's better than a standard VA and much better than a TN. Contrast ratio is standard for IPS technology at around that 1000 to 1 mark. Black levels are fine, but not as deep as you can get with the VA panel, and really this is one of the main downsides to getting an IPS monitor over VA. The CQ27G2 we've mentioned a few times so far in this review has a three times higher contrast ratio with deeper black, so it's better for gaming in a dark environment.
This monitor also has fantastic uniformity, a slight dip in the top left corner of my retail unit, but aside from that, excellent results delivering a really uniform picture. This is one of the reasons you would consider an IPS panel over alternative, so it's great to see ViewSonic delivering a quality panel in these monitors. So, the ViewSonic VX2758 2KP MHD has already proven to be a very popular monitor in the couple of months it's been on the market, and I expect it will continue to be super popular if ViewSonic can keep up with demand. After all this testing though, we do now know whether it's actually a good buy or not, and whether all those early adopters actually have spent their money well. The good news is that in most areas, the VX2758 performs well. Response times, we've done a lot of discussion on that throughout this review, so I won't recap that all again in detail here, but the general picture we got from testing is that it's a mid-range IPS performer with the ability to push up close to LG's flagship 27G850 in some limited circumstances. I think the 27G850 is much better overall, it's faster with lower error rates across a wider range of refresh rates, but there's no doubting the VX2758 performs well in its price category, so no major issues there. It also surprised me with strong factory color performance, particularly for grayscale, and it supports a decent wide gamut experience. When you combine that with fantastic uniformity, excellent viewing angles, and decent brightness, this monitor delivers a great viewing experience that holds up really well, especially especially after calibration. There are a few neat bonuses here too, like great input lag and a backlight strobing mode for blur reduction. Most of the downsides here aren't really related to the panel itself, which is great news for those that just want a good quality panel. The build quality is lackluster, the stand doesn't support much adjustability, and the on-screen display is awkward to use and doesn't include many features. I guess another downside is the top level of performance is only really usable at 144Hz, with most of the adaptive sync range requiring a slower overdrive mode to avoid overshoot. So how does the VX27582 KP MHD end up looking in the market and is it worth buying? Well let's look at the three main comparisons individually. Firstly, the LG 27G850 is still a much better monitor with a better quality panel, better performance and better design. This isn't a huge surprise as it costs about $180 more and it is a high-end monitor, not a mid-range option, but unfortunately for those hoping for a miracle, the VX2758 isn't just a cheap 27G850. Compared to the Pixio PX7 Prime, I'd easily recommend the VX2758 2KP MHD and this would make it my new go-to value IPS gaming monitor option. Option. The PX7 Prime costs $430, so more than $100 more, and for that extra price you're basically getting a better stand and a slightly higher refresh rate. Response time performance between these two monitors ends up very similar. I don't think the difference between 144Hz and 165Hz is all that large, so save the cash and get the ViewSonic monitor instead. The most interesting comparison to me is between the VX2758 and cheaper VA monitors like the AOC CQ27G which is, in Australia, about $50 cheaper. In the USA, the CQ27G1, which is a very similar model, is about $250. Despite being IPS, the VX2758 isn't that much faster, often trading blows in terms of response times, with the CQ27G2 actually getting a win at a 60Hz refresh rate. I think a lot of people might be expecting this mid-range IPS to be much faster, but it's not. The battle is much closer than that. For many people that just want a good high refresh 1440p experience at a low price, the CQ27G2 is still a really great buy. Of course, the VX2758 is better in some areas, with less dark level smearing, better viewing angles, better wide gamut performance, better factory calibration, and it has a flat panel. It's not as good in areas like ergonomics and contrast ratio, but overall that's enough good stuff to justify the price increase in my opinion. It's just not worlds better. It's not a case where you can see the term IPS and just assume it's significantly better. That isn't reality, and to me, where this monitor and budget VAs are priced is just perfect right now. It means there's great options for people of different budgets. I'm also super happy to see high refresh IPS monitors hit new and lower price points than ever before. There's lots of competition in the 1440p market. There are great buys to be had right now, so it is a great time to upgrade. Maybe wait for CES next week just just in case something catches your eye there. But yeah, lots of great stuff available right now. I think it's a good time to buy. And that's it for this one. 
As always, you can subscribe for more monitor reviews. We're hoping to do, I guess, one of these every week on Hardware Unboxed throughout 2020. So we'll certainly be keeping you up to date with all of the monitor releases throughout the year, all the major ones, lots of budget stuff we'll be covering. So yeah, subscribe for our monitor coverage. Uh, what else? I guess if you're interested in supporting us directly, you can click the links below, head to our Patreon page and sign up there. You get access to stuff like our Discord chat, monthly live streams. We also have the merch store if you want hoodies like this and other stuff. Also links in the description below for that. And yeah, that's it. We'll see you next week for some CES coverage and I'll catch you again in the next one.